There is a song from the 70s, so hopefully you, some of you will remember this. Many of you will remember this. There is a song from the 70s recorded by Dion Warwick. Uh, Dion Warwick had a lot of hits. Uh, Dion Warwick was produced and, uh, and, 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 and songs were written by uh, Engelbert Humperdinck for her and Burt Bacharach and so all these, uh, all these big names. Uh, Dion Warwick would sing it. But there's a, a Grammy Award winning gold certified 1979 hit. Uh, the chorus goes like this. I know I'll never love. Very good. You remember. I know I'll never love this way again. Um, so I keep holding on. Tim, you should know this song. Before the good is gone. I know I'll never love this way again. And then he goes on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. And then um, every time I hear it, it, it brings helplessness to me. Uh, it, bling, it brings a little bit of hopelessness. I don't know about you, but I'm sure it, it brings to you as well. You know, you start, you, you hear this song, you start, rem I'm sure you start remembering uh, your past loves, your past relationships, special people in your past lives, and you realize that that was a special time and it will never come back anymore. Not, not that you want it to come back, but you're just realizing that this person or this relationship is done and, and there was that time um, <clears throat> there was that time and it's not here anymore the reason I say this is because we <clears throat> we were when we were in the in the UAE and my sister lives in Alain which is a, a, a in the district or in the in the emirate of Abu Dhabi we went to a salon and it was owned by a Filipina and operated by a Filipina and she had like uh, four um, hairdressers who are from the Philippines and they were playing depressing 80s and 70s love songs on, on, the, uh, on the sound system. Um, and in fact, one of, they were telling us that one of the clients had to request that they change the station or change the playlist because she was starting to feel distressed about the memories that the songs bring to mind. And she was starting to cry, so they had to change stations. When, when you get to visit Dubai or Abu Dhabi in the UAE, you will start feeling you're in the Philippines. You really will. Every time I go to the mall, every time I go to the supermarket, I hear love songs, uh, Filipino love songs from the 80s, and both in English and in Tagalog. And, and I know it's the Filipino sales personnel, personnel who is responsible for the playlist at, at that place. And I'm telling you, it feels like I'm walking around, depressed, yeah, but I'm walking around uh, MOA or, or SM in the Philippines because of, of what I hear and all the talking and all the, and all the sales lady doing that. Now, wh why am I talking about distress-inducing love songs? Uh, it does bring back memories of people who were in your life once and now they're gone. And we look at that experience as either uh, an experience that, that changed you for the better or one that makes you say, well, good riddance. That, th that thing is done. That person is gone. We either value that experience or we don't. As a church, the question to us this morning is, what kind of relationships do we value? I'm sure we value our relationship with God. After all, we are a church, and that's what we're supposed to do, to grow in the knowledge of God, to grow in that relationship with the Lord. And so I'm sure we value our relationship with God. And after all, that is the greatest commandment. And our obedience to it defines our worship of God. Now, I know you know where I'm going with the text, so I want you to turn to Matthew 22, starting from verse 37. If you don't have your Bibles with you, we always save you. There's salvation here in this church by putting the, the words on the screen. But, but we need to come back to bringing our Bibles, whether it be digital or the traditional one, um, and not rely on what you see here. Because it's always good to be reading it <clears throat> while looking down. You might think that that's crazy, but there's, there's, a, there's an essence to that. But Jesus said this in Matthew 22, verse 37, and Jesus replied. There was a question, by the way, before this. There was a question, what is the greatest commandment? And so Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he goes on. This is the first and greatest 
commandment, and we're going to stop right there. To love him with everything that we have. You remember what I asked, what kind of relationships do we value here in this community of faith? Well, one, one relationship that we value for sure is this relationship we have with the Lord. To love him with everything that we have. And we can turn to the Ten Commandments. Now, this is now in Exodus or in the Old Testament. We can turn to the Ten Commandments and even that, however old you think it is, however useless some people think it is, defines our relationship with the Almighty. In fact, the top ten three commandments talk about who He is and how we are to relate to Him. And so I don't, it doesn't matter to me how old the Old Testament is. It may not matter to me, it may not matter, that it shouldn't matter to us that Jesus already said, well, this is the greatest commandment. The fact of the matter is, is the top three commandments talk about who He is and how we relate to Him, and so this is important in our relationship with the Lord. Exodus 20, verses 1 to 7. You have your Bibles with you, I know. You have to go to Exodus. It's hard to find, but it's in the beginning of the Bible, and so it should be easy. If you, if you cannot find it, you can always use the table of contents. It's there for a reason. Exodus 20, starting from verse 1, says, And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. Verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse 7, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Ten Commandments. And, and as I said, and maybe some of you have been taught that these commandments do not work anymore, that they are legalistic in nature, and that Jesus already gave us the greatest commandment after all. Listen, church, the Ten Commandments are just as valid today as it was when God gave them to Moses 3,000 years ago. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will be by any means disappear from the law. Matthew 5.18 is in the New Testament. To recognize the truth that our gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross is designed to bring us into harmony with God's will. In other words, to have no other gods except him, to not have a graven image that we will worship, to not use his name in vain is given to us as commandments so that we will grow in our relationship with him. Does that make sense? That those three commandments were given to us so that we will grow in our relationship with him, so that we get to know him more, so that we know how to relate to him. That is his will, to grow in this relationship with him, and that is why we value our relationship with him. But here's the problem that, that, that you and I struggle with, for sure. To many people, the struggle is not the greatest commandment. We tend to devalue the second one that comes after the greatest commandment. So we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 22, this time verse 39. And verse 39 goes like this. Jesus, when he was saying, you shall love the Lord your God, remember that verse we, we read a while ago? He didn't stop and have dinner or went away and said, oh, by the way, I have a, a follow-up to that. He did not go for a week, and after that, and after that, he died, and then he rose again, and then he just, he just gave that knowledge over and inspired the thoughts and, and the writing of all. No, right after he said to love your God, the second is like it, he said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why do you think he said, and the second is like it? It's like it. If you, have your, if you have your Bibles with you, see, this is what, what happens when you have a real Bible. So you get a chance to highlight it. You have a chance to underline it. Because the key word here is 
like it. You know, sometimes we say, oh, no, the key word is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. To me, the key words is, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, Jesus could have said, and the second is this love your neighbor as yourself thing. But he prefaces it by saying, and the second one is just like it. Why? Because the second greatest commandment to love others is founded upon the first because it flows from the first. Fulfilling the second commandment gives evidence of our fulfilling the first. That is why in 1 John 4.20 it says, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars according to the Bible. For those who do not, have, who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love a God whom they have not seen. There's no such thing. The Bible is saying, there's no such thing that you can say, I love God, but I cannot love this idiot beside me. I love God, but this one, Lord, it's just so hard. I love my family because they're beautiful. But you know, those other family, I don't know how to deal with them. So I could love some of my neighbors, not, but not all of them. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Why is the commandment to love others just like the first? Why did Jesus say it's just like it? Because this is our response to the grace of God. When Jesus saved us, when Jesus offered us salvation, this is our response to love those who are our neighbors. To the salvation that we have received from Jesus, in receiving Jesus, his words, and the message of the gospel, it is our natural response of every single one of us, the natural response of every single one of us to receive one another as well for his sake. Not just to receive one another because it's a good thing to do, but for his sake. That is why he said, it's just like it. We cannot only love those who are in our family. We cannot only love those who are in our church. We cannot only love those who choose, whom we choose to love, or we only love people who come to church and they stay. We were talking about this last Friday at the, at the youth um, a Bible study. It was interesting how what we value and what we don't. And, and, and we, we cannot only love those who choose, to, well, whom who choose to love, or we may only love people who come to church and those who stay especially. We love them more. You know, like, for example, you know, we can look at the Korean students from Hope International uh, university and say, well, that's nice, but they don't stay. They, they, they're just here temporarily, so they don't add to the numerical growth of Vessels of Hope. They don't add to the numerical growth of this church. Is that what we value? The numerical growth of this church? Is that what we value? The number of people that show up, and if they don't show up anymore, we don't value that anymore. And if they decide to be members of the church, whoa, we value them a lot. Pastor Jay gives them a can of ham or gives her some bread. So we value that. Is that what we value? Just the numerical growth? Do we not see that these young men and women receive a love from you that they've never seen before? I mean, every time they come, they always say, this is the only church I've been to. This is the only church, and, 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 and that is why I was talking about this a while ago, that two years after Benick and Andrew and all of those guys, two years after they've been here, what do they say? I'm still Pastor Jay. I'm still their pastor. This is still their church. You are still their church. And they take that with them back to their countries and forever remember the mark you have left in their lives. That once upon a time, there's this little church in Chino where they came to and was received and they were loved and they were accepted and they were supported and they were shown kindness where they have heard about the love of Jesus, where they accepted him and whether, whether they accepted him or not, whether they become Christians or not, still Jesus loves them so much. That's what they will remember. We ought to value the lives that come through the doors of this church, whether they decide to stay and increase your membership or not. We need to value the people that the Lord has brought into your lives. You need to value that. 
whether, whether these people brought you joy, whether these people brought you distress, whether you start singing that song and you remember, you know, I'll never love that way again, the Lord has a purpose for bringing them to you, no matter how hurtful, no matter how depressing their presence was, no matter how short, no matter how temporary their stay is, God commands us to love Him. And just like it, we ought to love and value the lives of other people because these two greatest commandments were not meant to be in the order of importance. These two greatest commandments were not meant as a matter of choice or as a matter of option. These two commandments is not meant to emphasize one over the other. Our love for God and consequently, consequently, meaning what's the other word, what's another, uh, another word to describe consequently? It, 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 this is the effect. This is the consequence. Consequently, our love for God and consequently for others is motivated. Motivated by only one thing, for our profound sense of gratitude. Our profound, not just a little sense of gratitude, but it's a profound sense of gratitude for what the Lord has done for us through Christ and through the cross. It is in response to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, and mind. To love, and just like it, to love our neighbors as ourselves is motivated by our profound sense of gratitude for what the Lord has done on the cross. It is in response to the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Amen? Amen. Let us stand so we can pray.